Okay, power to the people. Power to the people. I want to thank you all for coming out on this rainy day for what must be at least, at least our 20 maybe even our 30th observance of the 1967 North Rebellions from the time that the People's Organization for Progress was founded in 1983. We have observed the anniversary of the 1967 North Rebellions. When we first started our observances, we called it the Black Liberation March in remembrance of the 1967 rebellion and we actually used to march all through the central ward here through the projects when the projects were there. I'm sure you remember um, up the street. Well, no, right here was Hayes Homes. Over on the side was Hayes Homes. Hayes Homes was over on West Kenny, and then down here was Stella Wright projects and Scudder Homes, and we used to march all through Hayes Homes back here and march down through Stella Wright and through Scudder Homes. The Stella Wright housing project was the location of the longest public tenant strike in the history of the United States, led by a fellow named Toby Henry, who I believe is still alive. In fact, I believe he was living on Spruce Street not too many uh, years ago, but I think he's, he's still alive. But Toby Henry was a real grassroots leader and a tenant leader and led the longest rent strike in the public tenants rest strike in the history of the country and this area called this just this part of the central ward which included Hayes homes and Scudder homes and Stella Wright and below Stella Wright was the Prudential projects what were they called <laughs> Douglas Harrison thank you down there there were more black people per square mile in this area than any place in the United States. But all of that is gone now. But we're here today to commemorate the 1967 Newark Rebellion. We call it a rebellion and not a riot because it was a response to oppression. And it was one of many responses between 1960 and 19. 72, there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings in the United States of America. Many people don't know that. They might know about Newark if they live there, and they might know about Detroit. Most people probably know about the riot in the place that they lived in, like Plainfield, but there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings. There was literally a revolution taking place in the United States of America. In 1967, there were more than 126 urban uprisings alone, only to be surpassed by the number in 1968. There were more than 148 rebellions after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King on April the 4th, 1968. And many people don't know there was a second mini rebellion in Newark after Dr. King was assassinated and then going on there was an urban uprising of our Latino, our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters had an uprising in 1975 
I remember because I was in the area at that time. I lived on South 12th Street the night of July 12th, 1967, and saw the rebellion unfold in my neighborhood and how it spread. It started, of course, with the arrest of a black cab driver, um, Thomas Smith, I believe was his name. And Smith was arrested right here, uh, let me locate myself, right up the street here on Fairmount. Fairmount is about two blocks above Bergen Street. He was arrested on Fairmount and Springfield Avenue and he was taken over here to the 17th, what was called then the 17th Avenue Precinct, is now called the West District Precinct. And this precinct had an awful reputation. Black people had died in that precinct. And there was a belief that Smith had been beaten to death in the precinct. After the arrest of Mr. Smith, the Congress of Racial Equality, and I believe together with other organizations, had a demonstration in front of the precinct. And as a result of that demonstration, there was a confrontation between the protesters and the police. And that was the spark that started the uprising that lasted here in Newark, New Jersey for more than five days. At first they called out the entire Newark police force, which I believe at that time must have been 1,200 or more police. That couldn't stop the rebellion. They called in 700 state troopers. And the troopers combined with the police could not quell the rebellion. And then Governor Hughes declared martial law and the National Guard was called in and we were under military occupation and martial law here in the city of Newark. Many people don't know that. You hear about martial law in other countries and you think that it only happens over there in the third world. It happened right here in Newark, New Jersey. And not long after that, it happened in Detroit. And during the course of that rebellion, more than 3,000 people were arrested. More than 1,500 people were shot and wounded by the police. And 26 Officially, I believe it's 26, but some people say the count is higher than that. But officially, I believe it was 26 people were killed during the rebellion. At that time, of course, the police said that those people had been killed by snipers. But the regional medical examiner that examined the bodies found that none of them had been killed by snipers. In fact, all the bullets matched bullets coming out of weapons of either the National Guard, the state troopers, or the Newark police. So we come here today to commemorate this uprising and to remember those who lost their lives, but also to understand that this was a part of a process for social change. Newark was a city that was under apartheid. It had been a predominantly black city since the early 1960s, but it had a white political structure. In fact, before 1960, there were no black elected officials in this city. The first black councilman elected in what was called then the, the third ward, today is called the central ward, his name was Irving Turner. And that is whom Irving Turner Boulevard is named after. He was the first black city council person in the history of the city of Newark. In 1966, Kenneth Gibson made his first attempt for mayor and it did not succeed. He came back after the rebellion of 1967 and there was a new consciousness in the city at that time and the cry of that period was black power. Black power first uttered by a fellow named Willie Ricks on the march from I believe Montgomery to Selma. A lot of people associate the term with Stokely Carmichael because he wrote the book together with Charles Hamilton called Black Power. But it was actually Willie Ricks, who is still alive, by the way, that uttered the slogan Black Power on the Civil Rights March 
uh, down south. And that became the cry across the country. We wanted an end to political apartheid. We had all these predominantly black cities that had no black representation. So after the uprising in 1967, there was a new consciousness in the city. In fact, literally days after the uprising, not months, literally days after the uprising, the first black power conference was held downtown Newark. I believe it was at the, um, what was the name of that house? I believe it was at the Robert Treat Hotel, the first black power conference was held literally at the time that martial law had still been declared in North. And then after the Black Power Conference of 1967, there was the Black Political Convention held right there in 1968 at West Kenny Junior High School. Right there, it's still there. It's not a junior high, what do they call it now? What is it called now? It's, call, it's called Newark Tech now, but it used to be West Kenny Junior High School. And that's where the first Black Power convention was in 1968. Then in 1967, the Black and Puerto Rican convention was held, and that was held at, it's called, I believe, University High now, over there on Clinton Place. It used to be called Clinton Place Junior High School. It's called University High. And after the Black and Puerto Rican convention, they came out of that convention with, with, with what was called the Community Choice Team. Ken Gibson headed up that team for mayor, Sharp James for Central Ward Councilman, Dennis Westbrooks, I mean Sharp James for South Ward Councilman, Dennis Westbrooks for Central Ward Councilman. I believe that Donald Tucker was on that team but didn't get elected. And he came back and got elected in 1972. But those three were elected from the Community Choice team. But they probably not would have not been elected had there not been an uprising in 1967 that changed the consciousness. In fact, because it was still close in 1970. Adonisio was under indictment, but it was still close as a result of solid unity in the black community, allied with the Latino brothers and sisters, the Puerto Ricans, mostly Puerto Ricans at that time, in Newark, and some white liberals out of the North and East Ward that also supported the community choice team in the election of Ken Gibson. So today, all those folks, we got black police chiefs, black police directors, black everything downtown. It would not have happened had there not been an uprising in 1967 that changed people's consciousness. But it was a high price that was paid. There are families here today whose members were killed during that uprising in 1967 and we're here today to pay tribute to them so let us have a moment of silence in remembrance of those who lost their lives during the rebellion of 1967 let us remember those not only whose lives were lost but those who were affected in many other ways the families of those who lost loved ones were impacted tremendously. There were many people who were shot and wounded. They didn't lose their lives, but they suffered significantly during that time. Many who were jailed. But let us have a moment of silence in remembrance of those who sacrificed at that time. Thank you. Now we'll read through the names that are here. This monument that is here was set up by, actually I believe was proposed by the people and Councilman Branch, former Councilman of the Newark City Council, former Central Ward Councilman, made it his project to put this monument up that has the names of those who officially were recognized as having been killed during the rebellion. As we say, though, there may have been others whose names are not here. But this monument says, commemorating the 30th anniversary. And the 30th anniversary would have been what? 1997. So this has been here for some time. Commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Newark riot of 1967, 
we will forever remember the names of those whose lives were lost. So we have Rose Abraham, Elizabeth Artis, Teddy Bell, Leroy Boyd, Rebecca Brown, Mary Helen Campbell, Rufus Council, William Furr, Hattie Gaynor, Raymond Gilmer, Isaac Harrison, Rufus Hawk, Oscar Hill, Jesse Mae Jones, Robert Martin, Albert Messier, thank you, Captain Michael Moran, Eddie Moss, Cornelius Murray, Michael Pugh, James Rutledge, Victor Lewis Smith, James Sanders, Eloise Spellman, Richard Taliaferro, Detective Fred Toto. Those are names listed here on this monument. Now I want to invite any family members of those whose names are here, those who lost loved ones during the rebellion, there any family members that want to come forward now and speak? We'll let the family members speak first, and then we'll let anybody else that wants to say a word speak. Power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, my name is Anne Penn. Okay. Um, my name is Anne Penn. I come every year to celebrate this uh, memorial of the death of people who have passed away during this riot. My brother's name is Albert Messier. He's 18 years old. I'm here with my children and my grandchildren, David Armstrong, Desmond Williams, Antoine Penn, Dean Armstrong, Roberta Heron, which is my sister. They don't know too much about their uncle would pass, but what I tell them and the pictures that they seen. And this is the only way that we've been celebrating him. And every time y'all here, I'm here. All my family is here. So God bless everybody. Anybody else from your family want to speak? Yes. Again, I'd just like to say thank you for all coming out. Like my mother said, um, I was actually 10 years old when my uncle passed. Thanks a lot. I knew him pretty much very well at 10 years old. I mean, you're pretty smart at 10 and stuff. But I'd like to thank everyone for coming and remembering everybody that died during the revolution, especially Mr. Larry Ham, who I've known for many years. Out <laughs> to the people. Anybody else from the family of Brother Messier want to speak? Any other family members here of any of those who perish during the rebellion? At this point, I'm going to ask Sister Anjanetta Robinson to come in. Uh, are there any children here? I don't see any children this year. But Angie, if you would come and uh, put the flowers down here uh, at the monument. Thank you. Now, if anybody, any other folks want to speak, any the floor is open. Anybody that wants to speak wants to say a word. Yes, Douglas Tucker. Uh, I was 13 years old during the 1967 North Rebellion. I lived in the North Ward. We used to go to Johannesburg after South Africa. At 13 years old, I walked to school stadium, which was several blocks away from my house. I climbed on the fence of the school stadium, and the National Guard looked at me and said, get down from that gate. N, meaning nigger. I got down from the gate. I ran all the way home. I was passing in Bob Hayes. 
Y'all you know who Bob Ains was. I will never forget. We had a curfew. I think it was an 8 o'clock curfew in the North Ward. And I, we live, I live in the apartment building on Fifth Street near St. Benedict's Field. And there was a bar on the corner called Reggie's Tavern. Reggie's glass was broken into. It wasn't broken into by Africans. It was broken in by the police. The police broke Reggie's Tavern windows. I will never forget that day. And I will never forget the 1967 North Rebellion. Thank you. Right. Tucker is absolutely right yeah. because of many of the stores had Soul Brother written on them. And if you had Soul Brother on your store, people would pass it by. It was a Passover. That's right. It was a Passover. That's right. But the National Guard, the State Police, and the Newark Police, they shot the windows out of the stores that had Soul Brother written on them. I'm gonna ask uh, Sister Councilwoman Mildred Crump to say a word. Give her, give her a hand, Mildred Crump. Come on, I know you didn't, but come on anyway. Do what a councilman got to do. Um, someone had a sign that said, "I shall never forget." Is that that is, that, that that's that, that's something uh, we should carry in in our souls. Um, I work for the state of New Jersey. Um, for those of you who know me, uh, my profession is that I'm a Braille teacher. And I had a totally blind student in Sparta. And I went to the school district. I, I could tell you stories about that. Uh, I went to, she lived in Sparta. And so on my way home, I drove a state car, but at that time they didn't give you a radio uh, in the car. And so as I turned onto Bergen Street, I see people running like crazy all over the place. Uh, I had no one to ask, um, you know, what was going on. I pulled into the apartment at, uh, in which I lived, and standing in front of the apartment building, which was a uh, command post, were um, National Guard with rifles taller than I am. Um, so I shall never forget. Uh, I learned something new from Larry uh, every year that we hold uh, this memorial service. Uh, and, and, and I hope you're not going to misunderstand. Uh, I'm so glad Anne brings her family every single year. She, each one of us should be responsible for bringing bringing a young person, they don't have a clue as to what some of us have gone through. And so because they don't come willingly, we need to go get them. I'm so happy uh, that there are about three or four people over there uh, who are listening um, to what happened uh, in, in 1967. And so uh, I congratulate Mary and Pop for, and I'm a Pop member, by the way, um, 25 years, um, so, um, you know, just don't think I'm here because of what I do for a living. I believed in Larry long before some of the rest of you did, so, um, but, um, I, I want to say to you, keep the faith. All right, we have to do this every year. Nobody's going to do it for us, um, as, as, um, other ethnicities teach their generations what happened we should be doing the same thing uh, my last statement is I'm convinced that if our young people today the ones who are running around acting like they had lost their mind if they knew more about their history and about how it is that they are enjoying the privileges that they do we wouldn't have the madness that's going on. And so congratulations to all of you, because so many of you are faithful uh, to this cause, rain or shine. And we've had some rainy ones, and we still had a nice little cry. Hey, Sandy, and Sandy's one of them. God bless all of you, and um, I'm going to borrow a phrase, keep hope alive. All right. Uh -huh.
Are there any other folks that were in Newark at the time of the rebellion? At the time, let's hear from Amanifu, Brother Amanifu. Well, wait, first let me let me get the Newark. All right, come on, Amanifu. The Newark people is back. Come on, come on. living in another city that played an important part in the rebellions all over the country, Los Angeles, California. But we were paying very close attention <coughs> to what was going on in Newark, was inspired by the examples in Newark, as Larry had mentioned. After the rebellion, the Black Power Conference came and other conferences took place in Newark, which we were paying close attention to on the West Coast. You got to understand, some of y'all forget what a significant role that Newark has played in the history of this country. A lot of things took place in Newark that set the pace what happened nationwide. But when the rebellion took place in Los Angeles, it wasn't too long after Newark. Just like in Newark, it always, it always started with the police for some reason. The cop had roughed up some brother of mine in this business, driving this car. And it set off a rebellion in Los Angeles. That what they called at that time the largest civil uprising in American history. And that's because of the size of Los Angeles. Any of y'all ever been to Los Angeles, California? It's huge. South Central Los Angeles alone is bigger than Newark. And so it took them about a week to get it under control. Uh, it was so mean in Los Angeles and what was the battle cry out here? Black power. Black power. Anyway, the battle cry in Los Angeles was burn baby burn. <laughs> it was burn baby burn. And as was pointed out, any store that had Soul Brother on it, a black on, it was passed up. But the whole point here is that the oppression that we were going through all over the country inspired rebellions hundreds of them in just about every part of the united states and don't call them revival a rise they were rebellions any of y'all were born and raised down south on the segregation like i was you understand what the repression was growing up down south was like south africa was living under apartheid if not worse you know in some cases so uh um, we have to always remember the Newark Rebellion and all of those rebellions and people who were not criminals, there were people who were sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, but we have to use that anger for something productive to build and develop with. So this is as much as I would say, and by living in L.A. it just make me appreciate Newark more. When I finally came here, I worked with the Committee for a Unified Newark with Mary Baraka, you know, for a while, we were allies between Los Angeles and here. And those various conferences we had brought our people together from different parts of the country. We had black power conferences in Los Angeles that drew people from all over the country, just like here in Newark. That's where I think I first met Mary Baraka. We had one of those conferences in Los Angeles with a group you had called the Spirit House Movers. Some of y'all might remember that. All right. All right. That's right, give him a hand, Brother Amanifu. Sandy, did you want to say something? No? Not yet? Okay, Richard. Rich, Rich, wait, wait, Rich, one second. Rich, Richard. Richard Camarera, you were here in 67. Come, come on over. Oh, man, I'm too young to have been here in 67. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Larry. Uh, as always, we want to thank the... Uh, People's Organization for Progress and their indefatigable, am I pronouncing that right? Indefatigable leader, Mr. Ham, Chairman Ham, for uh, carrying on the spirit of this. This is the only, the only acknowledgement of what happened on July 12th for those five days in 1967 that the city of Newark has ever seen. And this is the only monument, as small as it is, to the people who were murdered during those five days. Um, at least the black people who were murdered. The, uh, 
detective and fireman scholars do uh, uh, assume that one had a heart attack and one was shot by another cop or by a National Guardsman or somebody. There's many scholars who seem to suggest that there were two uh, disturbances, if you want to call it that. There was one rebellion, but there were two disturbances. The first two days, it was the people rising up. The second two days, it was a riot by law enforcement, National Guard and the state police. Because no one was killed in the first two days of the rebellion. It wasn't until the uh, governor sent in his stormtroopers that suddenly people started getting murdered right and left. Uh, whether it was uh, Ms. Spellman for just trying to get her child out of a window, whether it was someone walking down the street on Freeland Heisen Avenue or Bergen Street. And the disgrace of that is, as the title of a book said, there was no cause for indictment of anyone. No one was ever held responsible. Um, I was 16 years old, living a few blocks away from here at the time of the rebellion. Um, it was a uh, interesting time for a young white boy who grew up around here. I was a very fortunate person though. Both my, um, I was uh, lived in a household that even despite its working class background for that time, was uh, somehow inured from the uh, a certain level of racial prejudice. Though I heard it from extended family, I was very fortunate that my immediate parents, and my father in particular, who died the next year, um, he must have been some kind of Garibaldian or something, because uh, he was uh, he was pretty progressive, I have to say, for that time, although he probably didn't realize it. Um, you know, the bottom line is that we're here to acknowledge what happened. Um, history is a subject best suited to reward our studies, as El Haj Malik El Shabazz said, um, a great American, although too many Americans wouldn't acknowledge that. And, um, you know, we come to, to represent and to show people just how much further we have to go. You know, as a preacher said, we're not where we were, but we're definitely not where we want to be. And, you know, every 10 years, we go through this, this frenzy of uh, memorializing and uh, of trying to figure out what happened, why it happened. Um, one very important thing to realize is that 1967 was not the cause of anything. Too many people say, oh, New York just went downhill after that. No, 1967 was the result of years and years of disinvestment, of racial prejudice, of racial oppression that was occurring in our city and other cities like New York from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Again, we just do not know our history. We are an ahistorical society. That's what has kept the evil genius of this system, both in terms of the, the triple axis of Martin Luther King's, uh, 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 where do we go from here, Cavs community? The triple axis of his evil axis was militarism, racism, and yes, capitalism. Um, these are things that we need to study. Our children need to study. Like I said, if somebody wants to talk about Martin Luther King, I say, have you read Chaos to Community? If you haven't read that, then I don't want to hear what you have to say. If you have not heard, read that book, his most advanced thinking until he was murdered, then you don't know Martin Luther King. You know, you don't tell me about, no, I have a dream, or little white and black children walking up the hill. No, that is superficial. You really need to understand what he was talking about in the history of this country. Um, so I think that one of the things I have really opened my eyes in terms of understanding where we are and the whole notion of moving forward um, and the issue of progress. You know, often we'll be asked every 10 years, hasn't Newark seen any progress you know, since 1967? Um, and it was, a, it was a POP program a while back that uh, helped me answer that question because I was a bit stumped because obviously there was some stuff happening over the years. None of it seemed to have any major equitable impact on the residents of Newark but one night, and I think it was at the public library, uh, Demo, mm -hmm. there was we showed um, a clip on well, Malcolm X at the time being interviewed by Mike Wallace mm -hmm. for 60 minutes. I think it was in 1960. <laughs> hate, the hate, the hate, the hate, the hate produced. And he was interviewing Malcolm X and saying, well, Mr. X, are you trying to say there's been no progress for the Negro people? Uh, in the last four or five years, he was in the context of, of Brown versus Board of Education. And Malcolm X just looked at him um, with that look of, of barely being tolerant um, of his ignorance and he said well if someone puts a knife in your back six inches and they pull it out three inches is that progress <laughs> that is probably the most salient metaphor of American history one could ever hear and that is one I use often with attribution until the knife of both class and racial oppression is removed from the body politic back of this country and the healing has begun we have seen no progress at all. Uh, and that is why we must continue coming back here. We must continue to remember, but we also must continue to struggle to move forward. So uh, again, I'm, I'm honored and humbled, as always, to speak at this event. And uh, thank you.
Larry and P.O.P. for doing what we do. Thank you, Richard. Power to the people. Power to the people. I'm going to ask John Brinkley, who was in Newark in 1967, to speak. Come on, hold the flag for him, Doug, while he's talking. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, yes, I was over on Aldine Street, and but I was at college at this, at this time, so this was my parents' house. And uh, I remember, you know, although most of the action was taking place in the Central Ward, over near Week Wake in the South Ward, uh, there were the uh, uh, state troopers and also the National Guard. They had their, their tanks and their personnel carriers. And you had to have a reason for coming into where you were coming. So I had to show that I lived on this block before I could get into, you know, my parents' house. And uh, one thing I, I did want to mention is uh, I, I came in from Plainfield. And uh, as Steve knows, you know, Plainfield had a rebellion also. But in Plainfield's rebellion, there was only one person killed, and that was a corrupt police officer. And one reason that happened was because the brothers down in Plainfield were able to get into the armory and somehow get weapons out of the armory and so they were armed. You know, and so there was kind of like a standoff. Uh, in Plainfield, this was student led. You know, Plainfield, even back in 67, had its apartheid. Uh, people didn't live, they lived on the West End, but they didn't live east of Park Avenue. And uh, there was discrimination and, uh, in the schools, and so the students got tired of it. And again, there was something associated with a police officer, you know, doing that, what they do. And there was the rebellion down in Plainfield. Now, in coming here from Plainfield, I noticed on Route 78, this was kind of shocking to me. I know that they had, um, they have a big sign on 78, a big uh, billboard. And on that billboard, you know, they flash different things, advertising movies, but they also advertise that terrorists, Asada Shakur, yeah. you know, and um, just wondering, how did they get name her as a terrorist you know who is responsible you know that's something that really should not stand that's something that really needs to be challenged right. you know you could name anybody who does anything a terrorist these days there's one last thing I, I do want to mention uh, before I hand back the mic uh, I'm a member of Justice and Unity which is uh, a group that have members on the local station board at WBAI. I'm on the local station board. And for those of you who know, this is a community supported radio station. It's a station, Larry's been on there quite a few times, that community people can used to be able to get on and talk about what's going on in their community. The station is going through a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of internal struggles and then now there's external pressures, a lack of funds, uh, uh, we're part of a Pacifica organization. They have five stations, BI being the most expensive because of where we were um, uh, housed. And, and so right now, we're in a state of turmoil. But we're having a community meeting tomorrow at Wisdom, beginning at 1 o'clock where Bernard White and a number of other people who have been with uh, the station for more than 30 years will run down the history and what can be done in order to save what is left of BAI until it can be brought back to uh, where it really needs to be in order to serve the people. So I'm inviting you to spread the word to come out 1 o'clock, 1 to 4, at Wisdom, at Wisdom uh, Educational and uh, Cultural Center over on James Street. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you John.
power to the people. We have another, uh, I believe, Newark resident was here in 1967. Carmen, you was speak. Come on. Larry, thank you. But I don't need a microphone because I'm just in power, okay? I do need a microphone. All right, here we go. With this microphone that I have, I was up here at 419 Springfield Avenue between 72 and 78, teaching at the Adult Learning Center at the time. I had come from parents, so uh, we're both Newark school teachers, went at Barringer for practically 40 years. Mom did work uh, at Franklin School. I was born here in the good year of our Lord, 1946, June 25th close enough to the 4th of July to have great feeling. And that great feeling is that I didn't know my city. I was born with a bronze spoon in my mouth. Oh yes, everybody else in this area right here were born with paper spoons. My mother and father had enough money to move us from the ghetto down at uh, Park Avenue and Stone Street. And we moved up to Highland Avenue. And right now I even have a carriage house up there behind a lovely lady who gave me room, and I'm proud to be able to rent up there because I'm only half a block away from where I was raised up between 1950 and 1967. I go to Ridge Street School, I'd hear those factories, oh Lord, I would hear them. I'd go back and forth at lunchtime and Tiffany's factories would be going, but who took away our factories? Who took away our jobs? Newark now, I declare, has 35% unemployment. If that unemployment were out in these suburbs, there'd be blood in the street. Newark right now has built giant, giant warehouses for children. I talked to my NTU and I said, no, that's not right. The suburbs do not have places like that for children. They have small, family-sized schools. And I'm sorry that Joe didn't hear me, but I know that the ghost of Pietro Patino heard me because he was my union organizer. And I'll say right now that we look at the Great White Way down here, and unfortunately, Prudential puts maybe 5% into the city. Well, I'm going to tell you what right now, as I had tried to walk for councilman at large, I will tell Prudential that if they don't do right by this city, I will knock on John Dryden's door of his mausoleum at Mount Pleasant on Broadway and get his ghost out to haunt the people. Because Prudential today, a million, billion, trillion dollar company, owes it to Newark. That's where John Dryden came. John Dryden came to Newark out of Maine. He came down to this broad street. He had a little hovel in the basement of a bank, but Newark made him great. He remembered that, but now Prudential forgets about it. Prudential executives used to live in the Forest Hill when I was raised up. We had public service executives living up here, Valesburg, right? Uh, there were homes they lived in, but now they're all gone. What happens right now is even though I have this devil's mark on my shirt, because my son's played hockey for 25 years, I love hockey, but even Jeff Vanderbeek did not build the opening for that great arena on Broad Street. And that re results in apartheid. That results in the apartheid that we have black and Latino on Broad Street and Caucasian down by Penn Station. Those doors should have been on Broad Street. I remember Broad Street. I worked at S. Klein's. I even went down here and talked for Prudential to tear down the buildings and build more. But how good will it be? I used to say up here when I taught that at night, for instance, you're there cleaning the offices, but you're not there as CEOs during the day. We have a country right now, and Malcolm, Malcolm said by any means necessary, even though it was three men from Newark who assassinated him came from the mosque here, and we're misled by Elijah Muhammad, right? We lost the great prince. He was a dynamic speaker. Dr. King was fabulous, but Malcolm was the voice of reason. But they will not give a birthday to Malcolm because he was too radical. Well, I'm sorry. If capitalism does not wake up on our broad street, grass will grow there eventually. Because if our wars don't come back, the city of Newark will never come back. They must help us in the West Ward. Central Ward, South Ward, great parts of the North Ward that are below Mount Prospect are the regular ward, not the Forest Hill. The East Side, we have many needy people. I am proposing that the great fathers of downtown, and they are great, give us at 3 o'clock the seed money to put our North public school youngsters in the programs at NGIT. 
Rutgers, Essex County College at 3 o'clock. No boy should be jumping on the bones of a girl, because at 3 o'clock they have no place to go. When I was young, for instance, I was helped out by Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. We had a very active Y. We had a program up here at uh, the tennis courts where Jack Squarantino taught us all free. Today I go there, you got to have hundreds of dollars. I call the North Museum today, they got a summer camp, but it's not for the kids of the city because it's $200, $300 for a summer camp. Something is wrong when Joe DiVincenzo, he goes and makes bread with the devil. And you cannot dance with the devil in the pale moonlight or in the light of Almighty God's day. You cannot do that. You cannot do that because Christie is against us. Barbara Borno running doesn't have a chance with politicians turning turncoat and running to the side of a man that they want to get mammon from. We are a state in the United States founded by the Puritans in 1666, our city. Founded for God. Founded for all the people, not just for some. Newark will only be great when again people will come out. They will vote. They will get organized. We've got to watch, stop watching Dancing with the Stars, The Voice, all these programs, and we've got to really come out and vote. So I'm asking everybody if they want to sign my petitions. I will attempt to make that great run. Tomorrow, the banks of the Pacific River at 12 noon, I will announce my candidacy where the Puritans landed. I want to thank Larry for all that he's given, but I want to tell you my heart is full of fire. My bones are old. I've had two failed back surgeries. Gee, if I had known that, I wouldn't have had to serve in the Army time of Vietnam. But I swear right now, I don't like what's happening in Washington. They're going to take away food stamps, it seems. I don't like what's happening, for instance, when we're sending drone missiles after innocent men, women, and children. Haven't we learned from Nam? People do not want invading of their places. Just like if people came from Mars right now, you and I, Larry, everybody here would stand behind buildings, right? And try to take them out. Why did the riots happen in 1967? They happened because huge Adonisio was a crook, but so before him, Carlin. And, you know, Ken Gibson said in 1970, and it's raining, folks, and I'm going to say this last word, wherever America's going, Newark is going to get there first. Well, let's be the first in a drive to unite everyone, downtown, uptown, because this city is full of great learning and university. But if we don't help our kids, God will not look kindly and send more than just this rain. He'll send hellfire on us if we do not convert and change. Because again, Malcolm said, by any means necessary. God bless you all and your families. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. I wanted to scream out, but I was stuck in silence. Saying goodbye to a life so vibrant. The way people doing each other these days is nonsense. Cool it. Don't lose your temper and rage out in anger. That's your brother, but all you see is a stranger. I ain't God, so don't think I'm trying to change her. All I'm teaching is wisdom, you know, trying to save yourself. All you want to do is sit on the corner and smoke your herb. Cuz your word is your bond and your bond is your word. But forget that mess and forget what you heard. The way people go in these days is making me sick. Don't you want to be higher than just another statistic? And when you're shooting up in the drugs, go to your brain. Take recollection of all the knowledge you drained, huh? Be smart, use body, mind, and sound. Wait before you pull the trigger. Put the gun down. Thank you. All right. All right, we got to stop the violence. Come on, Carlos. We got it. We gonna get a a perspective from our New York brothers and sisters, from our New York branch. Yeah, well, I just want to say that I know what it was in 1967 because I remember that in 1949, uh, 1964, forgive me, we had a rebellion 49 years ago in Harlem when they killed a young brother by the name of James Power. He was in school, and it was a big police a detective by the name of Gillian. I remember that incident. And it was heavy, and it was powerful, and it cost $2 million in that rebellion in Harlem. So I remember 49 years ago, but also I want to remember this to teach, that in 1935, 
Harlem rose again for the same exact thing, racism and violence, and the people rose. This time, they thought, the people thought that they killed this Puerto Rican, this young Puerto Rican kid, 14 years old. His name was Lino Rivera. And the people rose and they tore 125th down and they burned it. Next one in 1943. It was a sister that a cop beat her because they accused her of being a prostitute. You know, that's the police. And who's the biggest trick is to do the blue. Okay, so I'm just saying they rose again. So I'm just saying that these are, all of it is all lead to racism, imperialism, fascism undercover, but it also leads to the same old common denominator, just like in Newark, police brutality, killing innocent people, killing women and children, and saying they're doing it because they are so-called tough and they're riding the, a horse like the Rough Riders. So I want to read this poem in reference to the... Thank you, Thank you, Chairman. Forgive me. I have to call you Chairman, you know. My man, Chairman. Chairman, brother. Chairman, brother. Echoes of a doo-wop in our heart. Echoes of rhythms that flowing back and forth from the tenement buildings and projects. The sounds of doo-wops in the hallways and the stairways and the stoops. Street corners of Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue, Lennox Avenue. Joyful moments of endless pain of sugar corn memories, okay. misery, rhythms of mother drums heating from the pains that leaks into the still of the night. The misjustice of the devil with blue dress let James Power die in his hand. Gillian wanted for murder, Gillian wanted for murder. Nobody was dancing in joy. The cry of justice rolled to the mighty thunder throughout the streets, block after block. The grand 125th Street went in flames. Stores were liberated for their past racist exploitation. We have come from the edge of the bottom to the middle, listening to the sun rhythms to reach higher and higher. The black birds are not silenced. The lights mingle with the drums and thunder spreads. You're not a thousand miles away. You're still my love and I remember you. But as the heart closed, closer and closer, combat had a new laughter to check a new around. It was the beginning. And it should be the end. The black rose of Marcus Garvey, the love words of Sufi Hamdi, all praise due to love. For Druce Muhammad, that old sage that taught us the wisdom of beauty. Isn't that a real thing? As I shop in a botanic, an herb shop, to get my herbs to heal my natural self from the poison that governs our life, will you take part of my love, my mighty love, all in a dream that two are here forever? All right, give him a hand. Carlos from New York City. Come on. Sandra. Give Sandra a hand. All right, Sandra. All right. Hello. Um, I, have one to, I have one to say when the uh, riot took place in North, I was a very small little girl. But I stayed down at 112 Springfield Avenue. That corner there, Jumpin' Jive Bar used to be there. <laughs> Food Town was up here. And I went to preschool over in the projects that was up over by Howard Street. What I want to say is I really want to say thank Steve Hatcher because without him I would not be in this organization. Uh -oh. I threatened him to give me information. <laughs> but what I really want to say is um, we have started the People's Organization. They have a youth of children, a group of children, you know, every last Saturday mm. of the month, you know, we give black history programs. Mm. And I encourage you all to bring your children up to the Irvington Library so that they can learn a wealth of history about their culture. Mm -hmm. I was at a meeting one night and I heard Larry say, um, if you want to understand the fruit, you need to know the tree. If you need to know the, in order to know the tree, you'll have to understand the roots. And that was from Marcus Garvey, first time I had ever heard it. So I have learned so much history within three years than I have ever learned in all my years of schooling. Right. So if you're not part of something, you need to be part of this organization or somebody. All right. I'm glad to be here, but I'm disgusted because this tree right here shouldn't be here. There should be flowers all around here. And our city council, Ms. Crump, 
I would like to make a proposal if you can help us. We have the kids to get the flowers to decorate this area because there's no need for this place to look like this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sandra. Right. Give her a hand. All right, all right, all right. I want to ask um, Steve Hatcher from our Plainfield branch to say a word. Want to say a word, Steve? Okay. Somebody hold the flag for Steve. Steve Hatcher, they have an observance in Plainfield about the Plainfield Rebellion, which, which John mentioned earlier, where, where they actually liberated the, um, what is it called? The armory in yeah. Plainfield. Yeah. Yeah, and in 1967, there was a, a riot also in Plainfield where, like John was saying, there was people that raided the armory after this whole thing had started to avoid what could happen like here in Newark. And one of our members, Brother Cathcart, was there to lead uh, on a daily rally trying to keep things in order in Plainfield. Thank God for him because without him, it would have turned out to a lot of chaos. A lot more murders would have happened. But I want to thank everybody for coming out here today. And uh, we must continue to keep this whole thing alive because like people say, this is the only one that is going on around here in Newark or you might only hear about it here in New Jersey. So we must keep this alive. Thank you, Steve. Right. Here's Steve, had your hand. They just read on July 2nd, in preparation for the 4th of July, they had a program at the Quaker Meeting House where everybody read Frederick Douglass' speech, What to the Slave is Your 4th of July? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody should read that speech by Frederick Douglass. I want to call, he wasn't in, I don't think he was in Newark in 67, but he teaches social studies from a progressive point of view. I want to call Brandon Rippey, who teaches at Science High. Come on, Brandon. I want to say something. He's also the head of the progressive teaching. What is it? Newark Education Workers Conference. Newark Education Workers Conference. Um, first, I'm completely unprepared to speak and I'm humbled to speak uh, among people who actually live through a lot of this history. I teach about it as much as possible, and one of the things I try to do as a teacher is make sure that all students learn their history, particularly the history of this city. Because as somebody just said, and as Larry has said, to know the fruit, you have to know the tree. To know the tree, you have to know the roots. And I absolutely live by that philosophy. Uh, Frederick Douglass is a welcome presence in my room. When in doubt, always quote Frederick Douglass. <laughs> Most importantly, without struggle, there is no progress. So I thank Pop for keeping up the struggle. I thank you all for coming out. And the Newark Education Workers Caucus will also keep up the struggle to fight for decent education for students and all our young people. Thanks. All right. Come on, uh, well, we, we're not going to take no questions now, but we, if you want to speak, come on. Sandy, you want to say something? You're a Newark resident. I'm sure you have something to say. Come around. Come over and watch. I'm a I am also a Yorker, and I do remember the riots, but so much was going on, it was really frightening. But what I do want to say, I fact, the rebellion, real part of it happened because we weren't getting opportunities. We, we couldn't find a black bus driver. Mm. We weren't working in the major corporations like public service, and there are very few of us. Valentine's not hiring. Okay, and it looks like we're, in, we're going back in reverse. Because when you look at what Prudential is doing, the gentrification is coming, and a lot of us may not be in this city unless we try to reverse this. So I just, you know, when a gentleman just talked about education, you know, they're closing schools, it's happening all over the inner city. It's like we never had a rebellion. Mm. They don't respect our rights and what we died for. Mm. So, you know, you look at the uh, education, gentrification in all the things that you know jobs we're not getting the jobs here not like the other gentleman said what's happening in washington is atrocity i'm so disappointed in this person i just have to be real the things he's signing off are oh drones i mean we could go on and on and he even signed a bill that we cannot fight for reparations you hear what i'm saying yes. So uh, I don't know what to say about this president. I voted for him, but I'm very disappointed. So to me, the system is dead. It's finished. Mm. And I, it's just 
it, it just doesn't work. You know, 1% controlling your wealth, that's what I want to say. And I hope that we come together in the city. we got an election coming up, and we we got to make sure we get the right people in this city in North in order to save this city. The wrong per persons get elected, and we are out of here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy. Give a hand. One of our members and a resident of North. Brother Brown, come on. I know you were here in 1967. Come on, say something. No, take this. Oh, oh. <laughs> I hold on, brother. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ham. I've been, I've been trying to work with, with you and thinking about you, but like I'm saying, the clock is ticking on old brother Brown. <laughs> I was here, and the people of the organization, I read about you and hear about you, and I'm real proud of what I see you folks are doing all over New Jersey and all over the country. I see bus Brother Ham got buses going all over the world looking like sometimes spreading yeah, the good news. Horace Brown is my name. I started I started my furniture store right there on, on Jones Street in 1963 with a young man named Harold Lamar. Harold was, Harold was 28. I was 31 years old. And so we stayed there one year. And from there, we moved on on Springfield Avenue on Rankin Street in 1964. And from there, I was there right across from the famous guy who was taking everything that we had that wasn't nailed down, the Rich DuPont broker. Uh -oh. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'll never forget uh, that when the riots or rebellion started, I was in my store. I was in my store, and someone told me uh, this incident happened. So I came out, it was a warm July day, and people came out and so forth, and from one little thing led to another, and then the looting started. But the looting and, and what we call a riot or rebellion, it had already started. There had already been an exodus from Newark for many years. All the middle class blacks and whites had already started moving, moving out of Newark. And, and before 1967. In uh, other words, I would have never been able to have gotten a store on the corner of, of Rankin Street to start a business. In those days, it was it was sad there was anything in Newark but blacks and, and, and whites. In other words, and blacks were not supposed to own anything in Newark. Oh, that was all kinds of stores. The only thing that we were supposed to own in Newark was a beauty parlor, a barber shop, or a shoe shine parlor or a church, and ain't nothing changed too much. During during the during the during the during the rides, I was in my store, and I saw I never saw so much, I never saw rich pawnbreakers and taking in so much stolen and looted merchandise from the merchants. Me or you would have got put in jail a thousand times. We stayed in that store night and day. Yeah, uh, myself and a, and, a, and a fellow who worked for me, he's a deacon now, uh, Dave, Dave Shuler, over at Bethany Baptist Church. He can tell the same story that I am telling. But anyway, uh, that incident had brought tears to my eyes. I'm trying to write a, a little book on it and whatnot. And during the, during, after, the, after the rise of the rebellion kept going on, it's, uh, and they had to bring in the National Guards. Yeah, when the National Guards came in and they were roaming all over, I always thought that it could have been stopped with six or seven police cars. I really thought that and I prayed on that and that's what I saw from the window of my store down on Rankin and Springfield Avenue. But anyway, it kept on going and so forth and people started, the news started coming out, you know, and people started getting, getting, getting hurt and so forth. But the media, to me and to the news back then in 67, the media was blamed for keeping it the rise or the rebellion going on. They started broadcasting it like it was a like it was something. Everything that you know was like wildfires there. All in the news you saw different rides start breaking out and all other parts of the urban communities with blacks and whatnot. But as I said before and, and wanted to close, I never it seemed like after going on people started getting killed. And one of the ones that's not talked about is the role of public housing in the rebellion. As Larry mentioned, there were three other public housing developments um, that were around this area. There were a lot of people, a lot of working class people. In a way, public housing was to control people, but it was a boomerang on the ruling class because it brought people together and it facilitated rebellion. 
that that strengthens our struggles. Public housing, public schools, uh, and all the other public services, public health care. And that's where we're in a fight right now. We are calling, we had a year-long picket in Newark calling for a mass direct government employment public works program open for all, paid for by t making the rich pay and ending, ending the wars. Now we're taking it to a second level. We're going to be having a conference October 19th at Rutgers University, another public institution that's under attack, and we're going to be bringing together all the different organizations that endorsed the Daly Picket and many more. So everybody's got to be an organizer. We got to use every event we gather for uh, to talk about October 19th. We're going to be defending public services over here next week for a, 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 a day long uh, vigil uh, to defend public services. But that's not enough. We got to defend what we have and call for a massive expansion in the public sector. We got to fight for what we want. Not what Obama or the Republicans tell us is, is acceptable, is possible. we got to fight for what we want. That's the only way we're going to make a step forward, just like the courageous fighters that stood up in 1967. Thank you. Power to the people. we got an airport in Newark that should be paying millions of dollars in revenue to the city. it got a 99-year tax abatement. We got a port in North, one of the most active ports on the East Coast, making billions. They're not paying their fair share. Dow Scipio, you trying to organize the workers out of the airport. Come and tell the people about what you're trying to do at Newark Airport after the 1967 rebellion. Power to the people. Power to the people. Daryl Scipio, graduate of uh, Rutgers Law School. When I got to Rutgers Law School, they spoke about the rebellion. They said the rebellion is the reason that they created the minority student program. The minority student program allowed me to become a graduate of Rutgers University. I met a man at the African American Day Parade um, who worked at the airport in 1968 and his job paid him $8 an hour. Today, that job pays $7.25. It's, un it's unconscionable what's happening at the Port Authority. $20 billion of economic activity is generated there every year. Newark sees none of it. Newark still has to take care of the the port and the airport because it's in our city. We have to make sure that the roads going in and out are, 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 are well. So we, we actually lose money while the Port Authority makes as much as they possibly can without giving anything back. Right. So we need to demand that the over 4,000 low wage workers that work at Newark Airport and live in the city of Newark get a living wage. I think they, they should be getting, our, our, our living wage should be at least $20 an hour. Right. So the way that we win this fight is by organizing the workers at the airport, along with community support. Chris Christie appointed a man named Bill Baroni to oversee the Newark airport. Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, appointed a man named Pat Foy to oversee JFK. Okay. So Pat Foy says, um, I'll be happy to do whatever Newark wants to do. Bill Baroni says, I'll be happy to do whatever JFK wants to do. <laughs> so they just keep passing the buck back and forth between each other because we don't put any pressure on them. So we need to put pressure on Andrew Cuomo, Chris Christie, and the folks that control the Port Authority. Because we're, we're very specially situated. The unemployment rate here is twice as high as the states. But we have the largest economic generator in the state. It doesn't make sense. We need to do outreach and education and we need to get people 
really riled up about what's going on over there. Maybe we need a general strike. That'd be beautiful. Power to the people. That'd be beautiful. Talking that revolutionary talk yeah, now. Yeah, wrong with that. General strike. Right. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with that natural. I'd like to see it. Yes. We have to organize it. That's right. I want to thank everybody for coming out today and thank you for persevering through the rain. See that? You stayed long enough, the rain went away. Baby, the rain went away. <laughs> I want to thank the members of the People's Organization for Progress for helping to pull this together. Power to the people. That's right. And I want to invite every person that's sitting here or standing here today to join the People's Organization for Progress. We are a grassroots organization. We work for racial, social, economic justice and peace. We organize and mobilize around a wide variety of issues. In fact, on Tuesday, July 16th, we will be right there in front of that building. That building right there is the Social Security Building. And we are going to the Social Security Building because the administration has put forward a new CPI formula to calculate Social Security benefits. This new formula to calculate Social Security benefits is in fact going to result in a net decrease of five to six hundred dollars in people's social security benefit. Now if you're a senior citizen and you're on fixed income, five to six hundred dollars is a lot of money. That's the difference between maybe getting your medicine and not getting your medicine. Or getting your food and not getting your food. They got money for prisons but they don't have money for school. They got the money. We got to make them spend the money on the people. That's what we have to do. That's the task that faces us. In 1967, there was a revolutionary spirit in this town. I'm telling you, you could smell it in the air. It was here until night, at least until the mid 70s. People talk openly about revolution. They talk openly about change. Right there on that corner was the New Ark School that had the big red, black, and green flag. Down the street was Baraka's headquarters, Hikalo Imwalimu, at 13 Belmont Avenue. Right over here where the Social Security Building is now used to be the Black People's Topographical Center. It was in the top where they taught me how they built 78 and 280 after the rebellions so they, they could get the troops in here more quickly. And they showed us topography is the study of maps. And they showed us all the maps all over the United States where they were building these highways and all these highways ran right through the black community. Why? Because as uh, someone said, or as Jay said earlier, they wanted to disperse the black population because as long as we were concentrated together, we had this revolutionary potential that they could not put down too easily. It was at the top that I learned about how they have a law in place to establish concentration camps, just like they established them for the Japanese. They can establish them when martial law, uh, war, martial law is declared and round people up. Even before Patriot Act, even for national defense reauthorization, even before Homeland Security, the FBI kept, a, kept and keeps a standing list of 30,000 30, people that they are going to round up if martial law is declared in this country. You see, they understand what's happening. We're the ones that are walking around in the fog. They know more about, they know that they can only heap so much oppression upon people because at a certain point, 
people will not take it anymore. People will rebel. Right now, units of the United States Army are being trained in Arizona, are being trained in Utah, are being trained in New Mexico to put down domestic rebellion. You think that when they passed Patriot and when they passed Homeland Security and when they passed National Defense Reauthorization, they're passing those laws for people over there in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. They passed them for right here. All that over there is dress rehearsal for what they want to do right here because they know if they continue on this path of the reestablishment of feudalism, we're not even in capitalism anymore. This is financial feudalism, at least under capitalism. You had a capitalist class and a middle class. Right now they're creating a class of, of, of a handful of rich people and the rest of us are gonna be feudal peasants living on their plantation. And they know that people aren't gonna take that. There's only so much that people are going to take. I know and you know, if you ain't got enough to eat, you're going to find a way to get something to eat. I know and you know that if you ain't got a place to live, you're going to take measures to get you a place to live. There's only so much that human beings will take. The lesson of 1967 is that the rebellions didn't stop in 1967. We've had rebellions since then. We had rebellions in Miami, in Liberty City. We had rebellions in Los Angeles after the beating of Rodney King. They had rebellions after police brutality in Cincinnati, Ohio. Where there's oppression, there is resistance. This is an iron law of history, and it is inescapable. And the task that faces us today is to recapture and rebuild that revolutionary fervor. Let me tell you, when I was 17 years old, I believed in revolution. I believed what Malcolm X said, and I believed what Dr. King said. I believed what Sandy said. Sandy didn't quote Dr. King. She didn't quote Malcolm X. She stood right here and said, this system is rotten and it's not working. It's not working for the majority of people anymore. There's got to be a change. Dr. Martin Luther King said that there must be a radical redistribution of wealth and power in this country. Dr. King said in his book that Richard quoted, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? It's in chapter nine, titled The World House. He said, there must be a radical restructuring of our socioeconomic system. And thus we see, since 1967, since the assassination of Dr. King, who was in this city one week before he was killed, that in fact there are twice as many poor people in America today as there was then. Twice as many homeless, twice as many unemployed. This country, is more racially segregated despite the fact that a person of African descent is in the White House and despite the fact that his wife is a descendant of those who were enslaved in this country. This country is more racially segregated today than it was 40 years ago and the irony of it is that the segregation is greater in the North than it is in the South. This state, New Jersey, is the sixth most segregated state in the United States. This school system in New Jersey is the fifth most racially segregated school system in the United States. This is where we have come to. Somebody stood here, I think it was Sandy, who stood here and said, I think we're going backward. This is not allegory. This is not metaphor. This is not whimsy. This is the hard facts that we are in fact going backwards. In fact, a black man had a better chance to make a living in 1967 than he does in 2013. You can graduate from Westside High School. You can graduate.
graduate from Central High School. You could graduate from Weekweg High School. You could graduate from Southside High School and go down to one and nine. Go down to GM. You could go to Ford and Mawa. Get you an auto maker job, auto manufacturing job. Work on the assembly line without a college degree. Make enough money to buy you a home. Make you enough money to put your kids through college. Hell, if you got overtime, you might make enough money and your wife wouldn't even have to work. Now, people got to work two, three, and four jobs. I don't know how some people do it. I don't know how some of our sisters who work as secretaries for a minimum wage, you can't pay no rent with no damn minimum wage. You can't adequately raise a family with that. That's why Dow is trying to organize those workers at the airport. People don't need a minimum wage. They need a living wage. That should, the living wage should be $22 an hour. That should be starting. And it is possible. But the task that faces us now is how to build a movement to make that happen. We all have the solutions. Everybody got part of the solution. What we don't have is the power to force this change into being. This is what we lack. This is what we lack, a movement. See, people talk about FDR. What FDR did, FDR did what he did because he was responding to a social movement that was in the streets during the 1930s. He was responding, look, in the 30s, they had the movement so strong, if somebody got evicted from their house, the people would come get the furniture and put it back in the house. That's what they were doing in the 1930s. We need a movement today, a movement stronger than the movement we had in 1968. And I believe that it will come into being. I believe this because I know for a fact that where there's oppression, there's resistance. It's just that the rhythm of time moves at a different pace than the rhythm of our normal lives. History moves on its time. We can't predict when and we can't predict where. But what we can do, what we can do is get ready. And that's the task that faces us now to get ready, to build up our organizations. So in fact, we can have some power. They want to sell the water in the city of Newark. We should have a level of organization that we could turn out three, four, five thousand people to a city council meeting. Make them councilmen not even think about selling no water. Make that man not even want to talk about it. That's the kind of movement we need. Somebody gets killed by the police, we should be able to put a thousand people out on the street in front of the police station. They talk about they gonna close 10 of our schools, we should take 10,000 people down to the Board of Education and surround it. Say nobody coming in and nobody come out until you guarantee that our schools will not be changed. This is the spirit that we have, this is the task that faces us, how to build power. It's not enough to just be an opinionated individual. That is not enough. We got enough opinionated individuals around here today. What we need are men and women who have power. Men and women who have political authority, who can speak to their neighbors and say to their neighbors, I think we need to go down to this social security rally. Who can go into the senior citizens building and speak to the senior citizens and say instead of getting buses to go give our money to the fat cats down in Atlantic City that own these casinos, let's get on the buses and go join Pop in front of the social security office so that we can get adequate social security benefits. There shouldn't be this thing anymore where it's, it's local this over there, and local that over there, and local the other over there. All of us are workers. Wherever workers are on strike, we are on strike. What affects one set of workers affects all of us. All of us should be on somebody's picket line. They're gonna lay off teachers. I'm not a teacher, but I should join the picket line. They're gonna organize 
or airport workers. I'm not an airport worker, but I should get on the airport workers' picket lines. They're going to raise tuition at Rutgers. I don't, I'm not a student at Rutgers, but I know if they raise that tuition, it's going to hurt people in my community. I should join with those students. That's the revolutionary perspective. And rebel, we got to tear down these walls that divided us. We've been divided too long. We must unite and we must have action. We got to stop turning the movement into another form of entertainment. Let me go hear Larry speak. Let me go hear Baraka speak. Let me go hear Farrakhan speak. And when the speaking is over, I'm going to go home and sit my ass back down in front of the television. No, the movement is not your entertainment. We speak to educate you so that your consciousness can be raised, so that you can act. The point of the world, the point of all of this is not simply to talk about change, but to make change. So we've got to build up, build up our organizations. Get strong, build up the People's Organization for Progress. Build up the NAACP. Make alliances and coalitions. I'm the chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, but I'm also a member of the NAACP. All right. We should be, look, the corporations, they on each other's board. You look at the board of directors. The banks sit on the auto corporation, and the auto corporations sit on the food. Look, they join each other's organizations. We should have enough sense to join each other's organization. Right. We got to fight, brothers and sisters. We can't just talk about Malcolm and talk about Dr. King. Dr. King was alive. He wouldn't be talking about no damn birthday celebrations. He'd be talking about where's my movement? Right. Where's my demonstration? Where's my protest? Right. Where's my sit-in? Where's my revolution? Y'all let my revolution die. You build me a statue and you let my revolution die. Right. What That's sense right. does that make? Right. I don't want no That's statue. Right. I want a revolution. That's, right. That's the greatest monument that we can make to Dr. King is to build a movement to turn this country upside down. Don't teach me about the Bible. Don't tell me that it says the first shall be last and the last shall be first because I'm going to take that to heart and I'm going to try and go out here and make the first last and the last first. Don't tell me about Jesus who went into the temple and kicked over the tables of the money changers because I might run down there to Wells Fargo and I might want to kick over some tables in Wells Fargo. Don't tell me about feeding the poor. I might want to go break open the supermarket, pull my truck up, get something, go out here and give it to the poor. I'm telling you, we need a movement. We need action. We need people who are ready to dedicate their lives once again to the struggle. I don't have many more years left on this planet, but I tell you, if I'm too old to walk, if I'm stuck up in the White House nursing home where my mother was and I can't move and I can't talk, I want you to come up there, Jay. I want you to come up there, Dow. I want you to come up there, Steve. Get my old crippled ass and put it in a wheelchair and wheel me down to the protest and stick a sign on me. If I can't talk and I can't see and I can't move, put that sign on me. Put me on a picket line. I want to die on the battlefield. Don't tell me about spirituals, about dying on the battlefield, because I might take it to heart and I might really want to die on the battlefield. I'm telling you. We live in urgent times, brothers and sisters. Right, bro. This is a, not a time for the faint hearted. Right, Don't talk about revolution if you're not serious about it. Don't even toy around with it. Your tongue might catch on fire. I'm telling you, we need people who are ready to fight. We need people who are ready to get back out here. Now I'm not talking about dying. I'm talking about getting back out here and organize our people. Get them organized. In, in numbers like they've never been organized before. Don't tell me about Marcus Garvey and how he had the largest black organization. That was in 1921. We need a new Marcus Garvey with a new organization that has a million people. Right. I don't want to live in the, I don't, I don't study history to live in the past. I study history to draw out its lessons so that I can apply those lessons. 
to the struggle that faces us today. Right. These people here, we must not let their sacrifice be in vain. They laid down their lives, as so many who laid down their lives during the Civil Rights Movement, during the Black Power Movement. So many who didn't lay down their lives but had their lives snatched from them. And they political prisoners in our jails. Look at Sunyata Kohli. They never gonna let him out of jail. We must make sure his sacrifice has not been in vain. He got to know we got to send Mumia a message, yeah. not in writing, but send Mumia a message in our actions that your sacrifice is not in vain, that we're struggling for the ideals for which you laid down your life. This is a serious time, brothers and sisters. I like that song I hear it in the club. Don't be surprised when I tell you I go to the club. That's right, I go right up here to Queen of Sheba. Or I go down there on William Street to Mentors. Or I go up to uh, Marlowe's in Irvington. I go to the club, but they got a club song right now that sound pretty good. 1968, how many heard, heard, heard the song? 1968, 1960 what? 1960 who? Hey, ain't no need for sunlight. Ain't no need for moonlight. Ain't no need for starlight. Cause it's burning real bright. And he's not talking about no abstract burning. They talking about burning that went down in these riots in 1968. That's the kind of music we need today. That's the kind of spirit we got to recapture that revolutionary spirit. So I thank everybody for coming out today. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. This brother here wants to say two minutes. I just want to say that this brother is talking about is this real, is this concrete that we are standing on here today. These people, they have their own hidden agenda. They don't care who child eats. They don't care who child goes to school as long as their money comes in. But the thing we got to do is we got to be unified. We got to have unity. So you have to stand for something. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for nothing. And that's what they're giving us here. You know, I, I was telling the guy earlier this week, it, it's the truth, like, how many mayors have you seen at this whole United States on TV more than Cory Booker? None of them. So he says he come to our city here in North to bring us up, to give us jobs, to help our children. He done all of this, but now he's running for senator. So all that stuff he was doing was just to publicize himself. He wasn't trying to help out the city of North. He was trying to help himself out. So like this brother is saying, what well, we said, we got to help each other out. There's no color in this. There's no black, there's no white, there's no Spanish. There's just people and blood and being hungry and worrying about your medication for your old aunt, your old grandmother. I can say that social security stuff is real because some of these people don't have jobs. Some of these people don't have the physical means to go out and make money to provide for their families. They put their time in years ago and they're depending on their social security to keep them alive. So what I say is, you gotta hit them where it hurt. And where it hurt is in their pockets. And what I mean by this, when you vote for a politician, know about this man who you voting for. Because he'll tell us anything in our face and when he get up there in office, he do whatever he want and whatever the capitalism want him to do. He's not really concerned about what happens in the cities you know what I mean? In the urban cities, in the homes, in our community, he doesn't care. He made it there for himself. The same thing I said about Mr. Booker. Like, Sharp James was a good mayor. He was. In spite of everything he did, he got a lot of my friends' jobs. And they're still working today. You go to that man, he ain't getting you no job. How many people up there in that city hall that ain't from North? They come from all over the place to come work here in North. You ain't got nobody from North working in there. Huh? How about this? He gonna appoint somebody in the council. He couldn't even do it. They flipped it on him in there. He gonna try to put somebody in office that he couldn't even do. Basically what I'm trying to say to you people, I'm pleading to you people is that you have to love one another and respect one another first before you can do anything for yourself. Because if you don't care about yourself, you ain't gonna give a damn about the next person next to you. So you have to care about your community you have to care about your children. You have to care about what happens here. You understand me? So you don't vote for these slick people. I mean, you don't vote for these people that smile in your face and stab you in the back as soon as they get in office. Because that's what they do. 
That's what they do. And like this gentleman said, if you can get up and come with a sign on you, you don't even have to talk. You're sending a message to these people right now that you're not going to stand for this. You understand? Because if you continue to let these people do what they do, we ain't going to have nothing, man. We ain't going to have nothing. It's going to be just as communist as Russia used to be. They're going to give you what they want you to have and ration out what you want you to have and give it all to the rich and to themselves. Like the other day they had this thing talk about stop and frisk. Who you want to stop and frisk the person for walking to work or coming home? What you need to be doing with that money is, is educating these kids in school, paying them for a trade like they used to do when I was younger. They had a CETA program. They teach a kid a trade and pay him while he was learning the trade. That way he can do something positive for himself and help out his community. I strongly suggest that y'all take heed to what this brother's been telling you. And it's not about being rebellious. It's about being tired. It ain't about trying to inflict no discomfort on nobody else. It's about change. It's about changing your community. I mean, you should be able to, 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 to look at the next guy, kid, and tell him, you're doing wrong, man. Don't do that. Don't do that. Nowadays, these people don't give a damn. They see you slap somebody and snatch a woman's pocketbook and run. Ain't nobody going to try to stop that. And that's what these people doing to us now. They're taking from us by force. They're taking our Social Security away. I've been working all my life. And when it's time for me to have Social Security, I want it to be there. But by the time I get to get it, it's going to be gone. If you people don't stand up and tell them no means no. Thank you. Power to the people. That's a good note to end on. We're going.